Well, the Greens have released their housing policy. Say hi, Macy. Just dropping, just dropping the girls off at school. No one's watching me. So just dropping the girls off at school. Oh, there's one person. Yay. Hey, Mel. Um, so the Greens have released their housing policy for the Queensland state government election. And um, essentially the policy says that they're going to create 200,000 new homes in the next uh, 10 years, costing $10 billion. Um, they're talking about extra jobs, which would be there anyway. Um, it's going to be funded by a vacancy tax. So if you don't rent your property out, you're going to uh, pay a tax. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they're, they're predicting that they're going to run at a profit by 2037. So 2037 before this housing policy will actually return them any money and that's based on the fact that they believe that the maintenance upkeep is going to be enough um, for those older homes which I don't think they've allowed for um, and so you just go there's a couple of flaws in your plan they've, they've linked they've linked the uh, policy to three other countries overseas which have completely different demographics different setup different economics and you know it's like saying that the Australian housing market is the same as the US market which is the same as the Japanese market you know let's face it the if you look at the American market where they said that they have to have a drop in in house pricing uh, when you looked at what happened the GFC was really a um, you know a second tier lending market that created the issues and the price drop that happened in 2008 to 2011 in the US increased so currently right down right now you're actually well above those prices in the US so there really wasn't a, a housing crisis it came from somewhere else. hey look um, so Okay, so let's talk about the 200,000 homes with $10 billion, I think it was, or something like that. Um, that means that, I did my figures when I looked at the policy, that means that $300,000 per home is what they're relying on producing in the next 10 years. So you go, hang on, $300,000 a home. That means, to me, you can't produce a home for $300,000 when you have when you have land costs at the cost that they're currently at. So essentially what they're saying is, we're gonna take government land and we're gonna do the old style 1960 blocks of units everywhere and we're gonna pack in um, people into those homes at like sardines because they haven't, they haven't in their policy also increased the amount of cost um, just on wage increases and cost of building products to go upwards. So I think that, um, and, and don't get me wrong here, okay? I'm not from a, well, I, I follow a political party, but if they do something wrong, I'll say it. Now, for me, it's not about the Greens, it's not about Labor, it's not about Liberals, it's not about the sex party, it's not about any of that. It's about the correct housing policy for Australia. So stop comparing ourselves to everyone else because we've got a whole different set of metrics that don't actually equate and when and when you look at those countries. So let's let's look at this. Their policy essentially says that they're going to lock in social housing generationally for the next 40 years. That's what that's what their plan is. Now we know that from uh, ex past experience that building blocks of, of huge amount of properties where you're going to put um, generational social housing in is not going to be beneficial in the long run. You're not going to break anyone out of their own cycle. All you're simply going to do is create the need for demand into the future that the government needs to supply. Now the government cannot afford to go out there and spend more money on loans to build this sort of stuff. Now when I say that governments should be creating good policy not putting housing to the market They're, the government's job is to create policy and change legislation for the benefit of the people that voted for them or the majority of people that voted for them and and spending money like they used to is is not on anymore. Economics 101 says that you can't continue to do that. Now, so they're going to say, we're going to be funding this through a vacancy rate tax and through government bonds, which eventually will mean that they can pay it off by 2037. 
they've relied on the fact that rents increase according to debt. Well, actually, one second. Um, unless you're locking in that debt interest rate, then how are you? Can, how can you actually really say that? Because eventually, if you're going to give someone bonds and you're going to give them a return on bonds, and interest rates in normal lending cycles at banks go above the lending of the bond, then you have to increase the bond because people are going to cash in, take their money out, and put it into a bank rather than paying the government bond. Why? Why would anyone have money somewhere where it's not going to? Where it's not going to make? Or it's making them less than anywhere else. So that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is they're going to actually charge on vacancy rates. So you tell me there's going to be a massive government body that has to go out and look for people that don't have rents or leases put onto their property, which effectively means that you've got huge amount of wages, huge amount of um, bureaucracy, huge amount of investigators, and then when someone comes back and says, oh, well, I didn't register the mortgage because it's a, a friend of ours and we've got a written agreement and here's the lease. You know, there's, there, this is ridiculous that all they're doing is setting themselves up for more. And they talk about that this is going to increase the amount of um, labour workforce to put this out. Of course it's going to increase, but there's a housing shortage. So it doesn't matter whether government funds it or whether the private industry funds it. It's still going to be an outcome that's going to create more jobs. So let's get to the solution that um, we're talking about and that some governments are seeing the absolute benefit of. And that is not building new. And if you are going to build new, great. But let's take existing housing stock, the 12 million empty bedrooms in Australia right now, and do a retrofit and conversion on those to provide the right style of housing. Remember that 80% of the people that require accommodation require a one bedroom or studio apartment, possibly a two bedroom at most. And 80% of our stock is three, four, and five bedroom homes. So let's be smart about what we can do. Now, an investor is out there forcibly losing money on their properties because their rent is less than what their, their weekly costs are. So if we can turn that around by creating smaller compartments in existing housing stock, we're actually going to take the complete pressure off the social housing list. Now, currently there is 30,000 people on the housing waiting list in Queensland. You would suggest that at least a third of those shouldn't even be on that list. They're suffering housing stress because of a shortage of rental accommodation at the right price. Now, if you can divide a house into four, you will get a better outcome, or five, or six, whatever it is. You'll get a better outcome from a rental perspective for the investor, but more importantly, you're gonna create better um, and affordable rents for each person. Let me get around the corner here. Um, and so with that policy change, one simple policy change, we could affect the market incredibly. Okay, girls, have a lovely day. Daddy, can I walk down? No. Love you, darlings. So let's look at this. If we took the Victorian policy, that's a great policy. If we took the Brisbane policy, which is a great policy. If we look at the Tasmanians that are about to adapt a policy, which makes perfect sense, the conversion of existing housing stock into individual compartments with one communal area does a number of different things. From the perspective of... Um, the correct usage of the block of land, a large block of land with a house on it, you're going to have uh, increased demand of, uh, sorry, an increased supply of rental accommodation and an increased supply of rental accommodation is going to create less demand. Less demand means there's going to be less rent um, as far as a return for an investor, which means a stagnation in the rental market. The stagnation in the rental market means that investors won't continue to invest and force the capital prices in a vertical um, trajectory. And eventually the capital pricing will, will stop and stagnate. And then people's wages can increase according to what the house prices are. Now, if we take the gloss off the, afford, the, the want to actually buy something, and keep it like Australia has one of the highest rates of ownership in property in the world. Now, why is that? Because it's an attractive asset to go to. 
oversupply the market slowly by converting the existing stock and all of a sudden we're in a position where like other places in the world it's not so important to actually buy a property now i'm not saying that this is going to change in one year or two years it is a 10-year plan so if we look at that not only are we creating better housing and better outcomes for the people that actually need it what we're doing is creating housing that brings back family and community now I know that you know there's share houses all over. I think I just read an article that currently there's a, a minimum of 10,000 people sharing houses across the Sydney metropolitan area. So that's 10,000 people that are literally le leaving illegally in houses because they're not set up correctly. Um, and and they could be, well, I'm not saying illegally, there could be components of those properties, a larger component of them that are set up illegally. Thank you, darling. Um, and that's operating at a place that's a, um, not a helping their amenity, not a helping the safety of the people within it. Okay, so if we were to go out, convert the existing housing stock to something that's relatively easy to convert, and anything that's new should be also converted in a way that makes sense. So let me say what I mean by that. So if we've got policy that can create a communal residence, that allows self-contained areas within a property to be built and people to live in, then that means that the self-contained communal areas, the self-contained areas, they can be in if they want to be, and if they want to share the communal areas, they can. And oh, the communal areas I'm talking about would be a kitchen, a dining room, a lounge room, and a um, and a laundry. But the rest, they've got their own kitchenette, they've got their own bathroom, they've got their own uh, sitting and bedroom area. Now, if you can provide that, what the outcome is, is that it's no different to a, um, a set of villas that are connected by doorway. So imagine the old studio style apartments that you would walk into, you walk into a foyer, and then you'd have a set of doors that you could go to. So instead of being a foyer, it's a communal area, and then you just go off into your own door, and there's a lock on the door, and you know all your possessions are in there, and you can measure the electricity, but the electricity and utilities are usually included in the price of the rent. So the Greens have got it wrong. Um, most, most of the um, government bodies that are putting housing policies out are getting it wrong. It's not a place anymore. So government should not be spending one cent on housing. They should be spending all of their time and all of their energy to changing policy and changing, creating policy and changing legislation. Now, what that means is really simple ideas to create better outcomes. Because ultimately right now, the answer to the affordability issue in Australia is the mum and dad investors of zero to six properties that they have in their portfolio. So if they have zero properties, the first one they should be conducting and building or retrofitting is getting something that you can grab, retrofit, put it into smaller compartments, and then rent it out. Now people say, oh yeah, but what policy um, can you do that in? There's policies all over the country right now that allow you to do that. We have to change the perception and the stigma of people that believe that the housing that we provide to the market is really crappy housing. We've got oversized, five-star, let's call them, hotel rooms with their own bathroom, their own kitchenette, and we get lots of people living in them. We get um, 25 to 35 year old employed people and their partner moves in and they save money and then within five years they can afford to buy their own home. We've got uh, 70 year olds that live in them. We've got 55 plus year old single women. These are women that uh, through no fault of their own were told at the age of 20 to marry a guy because a man is your plan. They looked, they started working, they started working their way up, they were getting to a good place in job, they get pregnant and effectively, you know, I'll say it bluntly, they're damaged goods. As soon as they have a child and they leave the market for longer than 18 months, they're no longer considered worthy of employing anymore. So they then spend the next 20 years looking after kids, 30 years sometimes with the space of kids, uh, look after the household, look after everything, get to the point where the kids leave home, they look across at the husband and go, this really hasn't worked for the last 15 years, I'm out. They get out, they get a crappy financial settlement, the cost of living starts to hurt them, they can't actually um, afford what the rents that are available to them, and, then, and their, their financial settlement starts to go down to a zero toll. 
and eventually they get to a point where they're struggling. Now these are women that end up living, this is the white collared homelessness of this country right now that we should have seen coming and they're living in their cars. Now they don't believe that they're homeless because as far as they're concerned, they're still, they're still buying the clothes they want, they've still got their mobile phone, they're still in contact with their family, it's just that they can't afford to do all of that and also pay for accommodation. So when we started building this sort of stuff, they started to turn up, best residents in the world. They look after your house, they become the adopted mother in the house, they link, they tell you when there's things going wrong, they fix stuff um, without being asked, they just go out and do it. And they finally get themselves back into a place where they've reclaimed their independence and the next phone call they get is from their parents. One of them has just fallen down the stairs and broken their hips and they can't look after the spouse so the, the, the daughter has to step in and help out their parents. And it's an awful situation and a really crappy, crappy, crappy situation for the 55 year old. They're in, they're in a shit sandwich. You know, they don't have any way to turn or any way to be able to make a difference of it. So what's the message for today? The Greens. You got it wrong, okay? And it wouldn't matter whether it's the Labor government or the Liberal government or the Liberal policy or the Labor policy. Greens, you got it wrong. The answer to a housing problem is not to spend more government money. The answer to a housing problem is by changing policy to allow mum and dad investors of zero to six property to go and invest in property and in properties to return a positive gearing. Now remember, if I've got a four bedroom house and it's renting for $420 a week in the Melbourne metropolitan area as an example, I can, re I can rent a quarter of that house for about $250. So effectively from an investor's perspective, I'm putting to the market something that people want, they're willing to pay $250, their utilities are included in that, and they are in a residence surrounded by other people. Now, yes, you do have to pick and choose your people carefully. We do that all the time. We know within two days if someone's not right for a particular house, but they are right for another house and we move them to somewhere else. Um, and you know, in five years, we've never been to a rental tribunal of any sort to, to, for, for any of the properties that we have. Um, so spending 10, billion dollars out of government bonds which are uh, going to be returning a crappy rate when interest rates are going to go up and um, you know the fact that they they've said that interest rates uh, that the debt is going to be lower than an increased amount of rent by 2037 uh, geez I know we need long-term policies but it's the wrong policy how much is it going to cost you in the meantime to maintain these properties to keep them up you know, they haven't really costed it, and all they've done is costed that it's going to be $300,000 per property. Now, I know, and most people know, that when government's involved in putting housing policies together, the amount of people that get paid before a shovel gets put in the ground essentially blows the market apart. And, it's, and you cannot produce, even in units, um, something for three hundred thousand dollars when it's produced by government. I'm not saying when it's produced by um, anyone else. I'm simply saying that when it's produced by government because a whole lot of bureaucracy and paperwork that needs to be filled out. And it'd be lovely to say that we could go in and put a set of plans in front of council and everything great, but that's not how it works when government's involved. You know, there's a lot of people that got their finger in the till, so that's not going to work from that perspective. Then charging people for a vacancy rate of their properties that are sitting empty and not being rented out, well, who's going to police that? How are you going to police it? When you do police it, you've got a huge amount of people that you have to employ to do that, and you think, like, it's going to be, it's actually going to cost more than the tax itself. Um, and, you know, so, so someone, so what's that going to do? Well, it's just going to mean that someone will put their rental house on the market, but it's still going to be a four bedroom house they put to the market, which is not what the, uh, the, the community wants. The community wants smaller housing when they're younger, smaller housing when they're older, and they want decent sized houses, not huge houses, when they're in the middle. You know, we're about to build, thanks Mel, um, we're about to build a, um, five bedroom, five bathroom home in 130 square meters. And I actually might go in and do a video on that now and show the community how we're doing that. But essentially, remember that a bedroom is only ever lived in for one third of your life while you're asleep. 
So essentially you are unconscious in the space of the house. So why go and build a bedroom? Now remember, in this house, our bedroom will always be a bedroom. But our daughter's bedrooms will be us usable space because I'm at home now. Uh, it's gonna be usable space. So each one of our bedrooms for the daughters has an open, is a U-shaped, has an openable front bifold door that opens up that bedroom to the rest of the living area. So when, during the day, they fold, they don't even have to make their bed. They pick their bed up, fold it into the wall, and from that appears a desk or it appears, um, appears a sofa. So it becomes a study or a reading room or somewhere where you can listen to music and it becomes part of our living area. So when we look at each one of those rooms, they each have their own ensuite. So we've got, um, there's a 12 square meter and three 10 square meter rooms. And those 10 square meter rooms with open path to the living area now makes our living area comfortable. And at night time when they go to bed, they simply close the bifold door, which takes them about 20 seconds, and then they pull the bed down and they're done. So. Housing is about being versatile in how we use it, not about building 240 square meters, 46 square meters, four bedroom, two bathroom homes, which make no use of, of um, probable space and have empty spaces for most of the majority of the day. No one ever uses the extra lounge room, the extra dining room, all those extra crappy areas are ridiculous. Um, and I'm building my property as a five bedroom, five bathroom house because into the future, I know that I can convert that to a B&B &B and each person that stays in my property, if, if I'm going to do that, has the ability to have their own bathroom. And effectively, more bathrooms means people that are more comfortable with where, where, they're, where they're gonna stay because apparently you don't want anyone else to know that your shit stinks, but it's a fact, I'm a plumber, I know, because I used to, I deal with it, or used to deal with it all the time. So anyway, the Greens, you've got it wrong. $200,000 at 200,000 houses in the next however many years at $300,000 a cost means that you're just gonna pull people together. Remember, when we retrofit existing housing stock, what we're retrofitting is people in different areas. So it's a government edict at a federal level to make sure and ensure that pu public and social housing is in every suburb everywhere in Australia. So it doesn't matter where you go to in Australia, there is what we used to call housing commission or what we currently call social housing in that suburb. So remember, if I've got a mum and dad investor that's sitting on a negative geared property that has the ability to convert that property to rent it in smaller proportions, then at least at least 60% of the current housing waiting list in any state will be able to move into that because they're single or couple. So if you look at one part of the country, you have 3,700 people on a waiting list, 60% of them are single, 20% of them are couples. So 80% need a studio, one better, or a communal um, self-contained area, and 80% of the stock are three, four, and five bedroom houses. So ultimately, what we need to do is retrofit existing negative geared properties so that they become positive geared. And because they're existing properties, they're all over the country. Now that means if they're all over the country, we're now spreading the housing waiting list all over into different suburbs all over the place. We're now creating an ability for generational social housing to be stopped and allow people to become. Now I, I the landscape that I see in 10 or 15 years is that it will be similar to the US where um, buying property in the US is something that you do if you want to, not because you, you know that buying your um, principal place of residence is gonna be worth double in 10 years. So if we're in a position where the majority of people that own house houses are specific houses for people to live in to rent, then ultimately that means that the rest of the housing market stops and drops in price. And if it's a stop and a drop in price or a stagnation in price, people can actually then take their wages, increase their wages over the time, and then buy into a property because they just wanna have their own home, because they wanna do their own renovation. They wanna pay, paint that feature wall whatever color. I hate feature walls. They wanna put velvet wallpaper on the walls like my parents did on arches on doorways and bars on windows, whatever you wanna do. So so um, effectively, what we need to know is that um, the housing policies are being created, and that the that also that the um, the legislation is being changed to adopt to this style of accommodation. It's happening all over the place. My wife just joined me, and I'm going to get off now because she's watching me now. All right.
Thanks, guys. We'll talk tomorrow.